Take your Bible, turn to the book of Hebrews, and let me just give you a couple of things to start off with uh, this eve- or this morning, and I'll try to get as far along here as I can to try to give you some practical things. Now, we've been talking about the flesh and the spirit and walking in the flesh, so you don't have flesh, you don't uh, do what the spirit wants you to do, or you walk in the spirit. That's a, uh, you know, don't do what the flesh wants you to do. That's this constant struggle that never goes away. That won't go away until they either put you in the ground uh, with death or until the rapture happens. You're always going to struggle against your flesh. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter number 7, he says, The things I should do. Now, good night, Paul. I mean, if, if there was a great apostle, if there was a great preacher, if there was a great pattern to follow, it would have been Paul. Paul said, The things I should do, I don't. And the things I shouldn't, well, I wonder what that shouldn't is for Paul. I mean, is it disobeying the Lord because he wants to go to his people and winds up getting a shipwrecked or whatever it would be? I don't know what the things are that shouldn't. They're probably not the things I shouldn't do. But Paul said, the things I shouldn't do, that I do. He said, I've learned that in me dwelleth no good thing. Well, wait a minute, Paul, you're a saved man. You're born again. You're going to heaven. You're our apostle. We're to follow you and as you follow Jesus Christ. And you give us the things in the Bible and the Pauline epistles to follow you, not just the prison epistles. And, and so he goes through all of that stuff there. What do you mean, Paul, the, the things you're struggling with? Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. You say, what is that? That is in my flesh. Your flesh is at enmity with God. You might get it under control for 15 minutes. You might get it handcuffed. You might get all the zip ties on them, and you might get them stuffed in the car. And then they'll whimper, and it'll whine, and it'll complain, and it'll moan, and it'll groan, and you'll have pity on it. And the second you turn it loose, it'll run off on you. (laughs) And then you spend all your time trying to grab it, capture it, bring it back in, and get it back under control. And you're like, okay, Lord, I got it. I got it. I got it. I've got it. I've got it. I'll never do this again. Well, in Hebrews 12, you find out that every Christian runs a race. Most Christians don't run a race to win it. Most Christians' attitude is, is that, well, I'm not going to win place or show, so why bother? Well, you've got to make an effort to try to win it. You have two things in the passage there before, you, before I go back over this real quick, and that is, number one, you're supposed to run to win, and number two, you stay in your own lane. Your race is not somebody, you're not racing the brethren, So the mistake that a lot of people can make oftentimes when we talk about the flesh and the spirit is is that whatever disciplines you're trying to employ in your life to keep you on more spiritually minded may not be the same disciplines across the board for other people. It's not your business to try to tell somebody else what they should or shouldn't be doing. It's your job to run your race, stay in your lane. But he said that we all have the sin which does so easily beset us, but there's a weight that's there also. And that weight is not a sinful thing. It will be likened unto a secret fall, but it is a weight that prevents you from running like you ought to run. Now what I put up here before you yesterday was just something that I've used over a period of time. This comes back from the days of when we had our SWAT meetings and after action reports and all the other kind of things or we had special uh, units that we had to do, a gang unit and some things that I was in charge of. And so after we had an operation, we would sit down and have an after action report. Your preacher just had an after action report. It would have been easier for him to just cut to the chase. I should have listened to my wife and we wouldn't have had the mess in my van right now. But he made it so spiritual, you know, I was just, I was taking the test to see whether or not I was really, you know, I mean, he'd have just been better off to go, she was right, I was wrong, okay, let's move forward. He made a, you know, a, 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 He made a public confession, and we appreciate that. I thought I was Catholic there for just a second, and, you know, that kind of a thing. So, okay, you've been absolved and all that, but go, go clean your car out, you know. But now here's the thing. For me, this works because this is how my mind works. You may not work for you, but if I don't have something to go by, in other words, if I don't have a plan, if I don't have a routine, I will generally fall out of that routine until that routine becomes a part of what I am, what I do on a regular basis. I'm not going to be able to get to it today. I wanted to. Habits are good things or bad things. Habits are good things. It's good to have a habit. For me in the morning, it's better for me to read my Bible before I do school, before I do anything else going on, get up in the morning and get a cup of coffee and do the reading. You say, well, why? Because the day tends to get busy. Whether it's a travel day for me or not, I need to get that done right away because things begin to interrupt that routine. And then before long, 
it gets to the end of the week, and even though I may be preaching, I still need to be reading, right? I mean, I got a congregation of people, they're like little teeth and eyeballs. When they come to church services, they have these little napkins around there, and they got a knife and a fork, and their eyes are about this big, and they're like, eh, we're going to eat something, so if you don't feed us, we'll eat you. And they know the Bible, so, so, I, so I have to really, I mean, I got to read to stay ahead of them just to try to keep up. And that's a blessing to have a congregation. You say, why? It kind of pushes you a little bit. It makes you realize you, you can't lay down and rest too much. Now, what I gave you yesterday was just something that works for me. There's some biblical references that I gave you to those things, but that's sort of a pattern that I follow. And the things at the beginning of those things, that never goes away. For me, there is always a need for there to be, why did I do what I did? It may not always be this situation when Paul says, examine yourself to see whether or not you be in the faith. There's not always an examination of, did I sin yesterday? Did I watch something? Did I say something? Did I do something when that idiot pulled out in front of me and made me spill the chicken pot everywhere? And did I get bitter at my wife because she was right and I was wrong? And I'm going to use that throughout the day here just a little bit. She's taking real good care of me, brother, so I know where my bread's buttered. So... But sometimes that examination is not sin. Sometimes the examination is the motive. So 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 deals with the judgment seat of Christ. Every man's work will be tried to see of what sort it is. 1 Corinthians 3, wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stones. What's the motive behind why I did what I did? Was it for recognition? Was it for appreciation? Was it because I love the Lord? Was there some other motivation to it? This part of the process doesn't go away. Why did you do that? It's always a good thing to find out why you did it. Now, sometimes, I'll be completely honest with you, and I don't think it's sinful to do it, sometimes I read my Bible out of duty. I know I'm a preacher, and I, 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 I mean, I, and I appreciate that God called me to preach, but I'm not like a lot of people that are called to preach and they think that they're special. I think God called me to preach because he figured I wouldn't read and study if he didn't. I don't think I'm going to get all these rewards up there because I was a preacher. I think the Lord looked down and saw a stinking paraplegic cripple that was mentally deficient and said, you know what, if I don't call him to preach, he probably won't go to church. I don't think I'm better than somebody else. I, you know, if you want to boil it down, one guy told me one time, and it's the truth, you know what he said? He said, well, if you didn't get paid to come to church, would you come to church? I said, I don't know, that's a good question. I mean, would I be there every Sunday? Would I be there every Wednesday? Don't tell me you haven't thought that. Well, if they paid me to come to church, I would come to church, you know. Y'all got the rough end of the deal. You have to sit there and listen to us up here. Some of us dry as cracker juice, and you have to sit there and listen to us. I don't, I don't blame you. It's kind of like, well, yeah, if I got paid, I could get up there and shoot my mouth off for a couple of hours. What's to be the big deal, right? So I don't, I don't think it, I don't see it the way that a lot of other people see it, that there's something special about me. It's God looking down at me and thinking to himself, maybe because of my dad being such a good man or whatever, maybe some of the friends I've had, and the Lord said, you know what, I guess I just better call that guy to preach or he'll just be a soup sandwich. He might be a drunk, he might be a drug addict, he might be out in the world or whatever. I don't know where I'd be without the Lord. But I've learned this, now that I'm serving the Lord, I can't just go into neutral. This is for me now. What I have to do is I have to constantly keep myself on the edge of things. I have to constantly keep making myself, in a sense, go to the gym. I have to go. If I take one day off, it'll go into two. And if I take two days off, in the four to be only four. And if I take four days off, then you know what will wind up happening? I won't have gone for over a week. And then all of a sudden, I think, well, I'll pick back up where I left off, but some things have gotten a little bit rusty. So one of the things that I want you to recognize is it's not an intent to jam anything down your throat, but I do know that this does work. The second thing of this whole thing that's there is is that once I'm starting to apply things like I'm supposed to, I'll get to Hebrews 12 in a minute, run the race, there's training that's involved before you're ready to run the race. You're not going to go run a marathon tomorrow. I'm sure they have the 5K runs or the whatever runs for breast cancer or the runs for, you know, whatever else they're trying to raise money for and things like that. And so if you're going to run that or if you're going to run a marathon or a half marathon or something, you don't just wake up one morning and go, oh, today's the race. You know, I, I think I'll go get my T-shirt and stuff and I'll go run. You, you won't make it a mile. You'll have blisters on your feet. Your back will be hurting. Your knees will be aching. A rescue will be driving you to the finish line. It takes training. It takes time. Training is monotonous. 
Training doesn't make sense unless you have a goal in mind. You have to have a purpose for what you're doing. God made you for a purpose. He has a reason for you to be here. And it's more than just sit like a bump on a log in a church somewhere. I don't mean to be hard on you, but at some point with all the Bible that you Bible believers have, are you ever going to do anything? I mean, besides just try to keep yourself straight and try to control everybody else, are you ever going to do anything? Are you ever going to try to win somebody to the Lord? Are you ever going to try to disciple somebody? Are you going to ever try to teach somebody the things that you have been taught? Are you ever going to put that ahead of yourself and what you want to do? Are you ever going to get the proper order to things? At some point, that's the reason we train. We train not only to keep ourselves clean when the pressure's on, but we also train with a purpose. We're trying to win a race here. I don't know about you, I'd like to have a little bit of gold. It might only be the size of my wedding band, it may not be much, but at least I like to have a little something. But, but if I don't have that in mind, why I'm doing it, guess what? I'm probably not going to do it. It just doesn't happen naturally. You can't get it by osmosis. So I do the examination on a regular basis. I do the application. That's training for me. That's for the practice and stuff like that. That's down here when it comes to continuation. And the separation generally will take care of itself. But once I'm separated from certain things, I can't decide to walk back up there close to the edge of that thing. And look, I put it set a perimeter. I just read a little bit of a book last night. The individual in that book uses walls, for example. So you can make a wall or you can make an example of that separation. But once you do that, here's the danger. In the book of Nehemiah, what you may not recognize or realize is, is that the first thing that Nehemiah did after the wall is built, they've allowed them to encroach inside there. And so he's kicked everybody out, and they're not supposed to be doing things on Sunday. Saturday was the Sabbath day, but for us it would be a Sunday, right? You know that, right? No business, no nothing, it's the Sabbath day, keep it holy, etc. You know what begins to happen? They begin to start doing commerce on Saturday. And they begin to go outside the wall and do commerce with the people outside the wall. And then before long, they're saying, it's such a long way to get out there. Why don't we move them inside the wall? Now, keep them next to the wall, but move them inside the wall. So now, all of a sudden, Saturday becomes a regular commerce day just like any other day. It's a good day for soccer, good day for football, good day for baseball, basketball, good day for fishing, good day for hunting, good day for sleeping, good day for whatever. It doesn't, doesn't matter. It's just a day. It's just inside the wall, though. Still, you're still not right at the temple. And before long, there's a man there by the name of Tobiah. His name means wolf. And so what happens is he comes in and he gets with the priest. He begins to have com uh, communion with him, conversation with him, sit down and have coffee with him and begin to spend time. And they begin to kind of relate, kind of like Saul did with Agag. Saul's like, hey, he's a king, I'm a king. And I know the Lord said kill him, but if they understood the stresses of a king, they probably wouldn't be doing that. You remember the story there? And then when Samuel shows up, he said, hey, did you hew Agag to pieces? He said, oh, well, no, I, I can't. I got him on a chain, though. Is that what the Lord told you to do with him? Do you ever think about that? Do you ever recognize, do you ever realize that the Lord told him to eliminate Agag for a reason? Because he knew if he left Agag there on a chain that it wouldn't be long before Agag would be influencing Saul's kingdom which was supposed to be run by the way the Lord was done. So you know what the Lord said? I want them all destroyed. He did the same thing Achan did. He just took a little bit for himself. He took the best and you know how that story goes. Well, in Nehemiah before long, guess what happens? Tobiah is sitting down and he's talking with the chief priest there in the temple and he strikes a deal with him and he says, listen, here's what we need to do. I need some room and in in place inside. I can help you control all the commerce in here. So here's what I need for you to do. I need for you to uh, give me a place to stay. And the priest says, well, the only place I got to stay is the temple. And he goes, okay. So he goes into the temple and he looks around and he said, well, I could probably stay in here, but all that stuff's got to go. I mean, the stuff that's for the priest and the stuff that's for the singers and the stuff that's for the rest of the Levites and the stuff that's to take care of the temple, <laughs> that stuff needs to get out of here because I got my own stuff to bring in here. And before long, guess what happens? Tobiah moves in, and when Tobiah moves in, he takes the things of God out and moves his stuff in. It happened when they allowed the perimeter to be encroached upon, the wall. There was a gate, there was a door, 
they were able to start coming in. They're just, they're just good people. I mean, you know, they're, they're nice. And I, I, I go down and I buy fish and chicken from them. And I get my, my gummy bears from them. And I, I get, you know, my, my hay. And I get my feed. And I get whatever you get down at the store. And I've gotten to know them and all that kind of stuff. And, well, you know what? You just said a whole bunch to them when you go down there and buy from them on Saturday. That's the Sabbath day. Your testimony's already ruined because you're down there having commerce with them. And before long, you know, he's my friend. I'll put in a word for you. Nehemiah, you know, he can be kind of harsh a little bit sometimes. I mean, you know, he gets a little rough sometimes. He's kind of kind of crazy about that kind of stuff. I'll see if I can put in a word for you. They go to the priest. The priest says, ah, let him come on inside. But now you've got to keep him by the wall now. You keep him by the wall. But go ahead and let him in the city. You've got to breach your perimeter. And when you have a breach in your perimeter, you know what happens? The focal point becomes the breach in the perimeter. And before long... Guess what happens? The chief cook and bottle washer moves into your temple. And he can't move in that temple unless he moves God's stuff out. And then before long, Nehemiah shows up and says, what in the cat hair is this boy doing in God's house? He don't belong here. Well, now, wait a minute, Nehemiah. He's a nice guy. We're trying to win him to the Lord. We're trying to get him right. We're trying to get him fixed up. And I realize he's a kind of a Catholic, charismatic, Church of Christ, uh, Muslim, and kind of everything all in there all together. And he's an LBGDQ, RSP, WXYZ, and, and those kind of things. But he's, he's such a man of the world, you know. And, and commerce has really picked up, and his political standing in the town has really picked up. And, and you know what? Our church attendance has improved so much since he's been coming here. And we've seen an increase in the offerings. And so, to me, it just made perfect sense. Nehemiah says, hey, wait a minute. Where's God's stuff at? Oh, well, 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 what do you mean? Where's God's stuff at to take care of the Levitical priest and the people that are tending to the temple? Where's God's stuff? Well, uh, uh, well, <laughs> well <laughs> we had to move it out. You had to move it out. Yeah. You know what he does? You know the passage. You probably know it better than I do. You've read it probably 10 dozen times and you've been saved and you read your Bible every day, so you probably know it. But you know what happens? Nehemiah goes in there and grabs that old wolf by the nape of the neck and takes him and throws him outside the city and throws all the people with commerce outside the city. And then he closes it and he sets up uh, guards over those things. And he says, first of all, he took the place of God in the temple and we're going to replace and restore the worship in the first place that ought to be there like Ezra said it should be. And second of all, we're going to set a guard so they don't come back in here. And you're not doing that anymore. And he grabs them by the hair of the head and smacks them around. And then he even gets into, you say, what happened? They had started mixing and mingling with the wrong people. So then the church becomes carnal. It's like Laodicea. And then it begins to be more about the rights of the people instead of the rights of God. And then when a preacher gets up and says to you, there's a problem and you need to address the problem, and you're, well, I, you got Tobiah living inside instead of the Lord. You're not lost. You're saved. All right, so I practice that thing with setting a perimeter. I check my perimeter on a regular basis. Sometimes the horses on the perimeter have to be, or the guys have to be spelled on a regular basis. Everybody gets tired. You have to be sober, you have to be vigilant, you have to remember that your enemy, your devil, is the roaring lion walking about, seeking whom may devour. You have to walk circumspectly, but every now and then you've got to be able to let your guard down a little bit and be able to get some rest. You can't stay geared up all the time. Well, when you get ready to rest, you better be around a group of individuals that will watch out for you while you're resting. You can't just turn your safety over to anybody. If I have a perimeter, I'm not going to pull one of the guys that maybe even one of the regular officers, he means well and stuff, but he's not been trained properly, and he might let something go when everybody else is expecting it to be secure, and it's not secure. And then the next thing you know, when you start the operation, you've got somebody in the perimeter, and man, you have no idea the problems that that can cause. So at any rate, the thing that I want you to recognize is, is this becomes imperative for me even now. There have to be, I have to set perimeters. I have to set perimeters on time. Yes, sir. Time. I have to watch the clock. I have to make sure, this is just for me now, it may not be for you, you may not have any problem with it whatsoever, but for me to get done what I feel I need to get done, I have to think how long it's going to take me to get it done, and sometimes I have to do without sleep. Now, I'm getting to be an old man now. You'd think, well, you ought to be able to sleep as long as you want to. Well, if I did that, I wouldn't get anything done. I'd still be in bed this morning. 
preacher would be over there knocking on the door. Hey, get up. No, I felt like sleeping in this morning, you know. Well, I had things to do, places to go, people to see. You have to be able to set a perimeter on that. You have to watch the amount of exercise and recreation you have. I think you ought to have recreation. I think you ought to go catch a fish or hit a ball or hunt or do what. I believe in that. Now the tables have been turned a little bit to the point that it's more about sports and athletics and spending time with all of that. And then you're so exhausted that when it comes to try to do something for the Lord, you don't have the energy to do that. I'm not making it a contest. I'm saying it's out of balance. If the Lord is supposed to be first, you want to make sure that you keep it in balance. So I just wanted to tell you this. A lot of these things right here uh, are things that will help you to avoid where we're at in Hebrews 12, and that's this thing right here. I'm less likely to have that show up if I keep that tight. If I keep my walls tight and keep a guard set there and that kind of a thing, I'm less likely to let the wrong things in. That's why I like being in church. Amen. You say, why? Because I'm less likely to be messing up right now. Amen. I'm more likely to do what's right to do. I may have the next couple of hours where at least I can say I don't have to worry about doing or saying something completely stupid right now. All right, now look in Hebrews chapter 12, and then I'm going to go back to this thing about disciples, and we'll close out hopefully the first hour here. He said, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every what? The things that hold you down, things that hold you back. They actually have a weight to them. Emotions can have a weight to them. You can get so disrault over things. You can get so grief-stricken over things. You can get so emotionally involved, so bitter. That stuff can have a weight on you, and it weighs. You know what he said? You have to lay it aside. He didn't say, I'll take it off of you. He said, you lay it aside. You can't run a race with, uh, what's the old preacher used to say, you can't run a race if you have pockets in your running britches. Well, that makes sense, because why? You put stuff in your pockets that doesn't have any business being there. And then he comes on down there in the sin that does so easily beset us, and then he says another thing that's important. The sin that besets you, every Christian has a besetting sin. And they'll generally be hung on that thing. There'll probably be four or five other things connected to the root cause, and the root cause is whatever your besetting sin is. Nobody in here is sinless. And anybody that thinks you're sinless and all that kind of stuff, you're headed for trouble. Okay, because what you have to recognize is, as he said, the sin that does so easily beset us. Every time you come around the track to make a rap, there it is, right there in front of you. And you fight it, and you fight it, and you fight it, and then you seem to get it under control, and then that cotton-picking thing crops back up again. It goes down here, it's like the whack-a-mole at the fair, and then it pops up over here, and then it pops up over here. You have to continue to fight that thing, because there's other things that are there. And then he says, thirdly, run with what? It's for the long haul. It's not, a, it's not a sprint. It's a continual movement. It's patiently. Obtain the patience. Patience. Boy, that's a difficult thing. You say, why? Tribulation works patience. You ever been in a real bad situation and it just seems like time slows down? And that clock's just... And they're having a good time at something like that and that clock's going... Time's up, you know. But, man, when you're going through it, it's kind of like listening to me preach sometimes. You're like, <laughs> like that. You know what he said? Run with patience. That means don't expect to be winning the race. You're not going to win today. You're running today. What are you going to do? Same thing you're going to do tomorrow. Same thing you did yesterday. I'm just running, just running, just running, just practicing. That's all I'm doing. Now he comes down to an important part. I'm going to give you a few verses on this, and then I want to move on to this thing. Uh, when it comes to that, because he's going to give you a secret to be able to finish the faith, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You say, why? You run with a goal in mind. Amen. Paul said, I press toward the mark and the high calling of God. Paul I says, I fight not as one that beateth the air, but one that so as to win the prize. I keep my body in subjection, therefore I find myself to not be a castaway. That's in over in, in nine, chapter 9 there of 1 Corinthians. Now, what he's saying there is, is that when you run, you're doing it to please Jesus. You're not doing it to please each other. You're doing it to make sure that you're running to try to look like him. And then he's going to show you how the Lord did it. The Lord goes up to Calvary's cross. He said, consider him. Think about him. Consider what he did. He endured such contradiction, the sinners, uh, against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in your minds. In other words, if you look at Jesus and realize what he went through, it'll help you go through whatever you're going through. 
That Bible says that he, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. It gives you this impression. The impression he gives you is, is that the Lord saw way over on the other side, way down there to the millennium, way down there to getting everything the way it's supposed to be and out in eternity. And that gave him joy. But the present moment, don't get the idea he was joyful going to the cross. He was weighed down going to the cross. As a matter of fact, in Gethsemane, the Bible said he sweat great drops of blood. That's called hematidrosis, but the, 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 that's a clinical name for it. But what that means is he's under such agony and such stress. The Bible says being in an agony that he was crying out. And he said, Father, is there any way this cup can pass from me? Don't get this idea that the Lord's in the garden going, ain't this great? Man, this is really wonderful. I can't wait to be beaten and made fun of and laughed at and spit on by my creation. And not only that, to have their sin put on me and have my father turn his back. Isn't this joyful? No, you got it out of balance. This is where a lot of Christians get real, real whacked out. They get kind of messed up. It's like somebody just died and you're supposed to be, well, you know, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Probably not a good verse. It doesn't, it's not a good time to 828 somebody, right? The baby just died. The loved one just died. The person's in the hospital. They just got diagnosed with a, a bad disease. And it's always the one that's well that hadn't been through anything that runs in there to say, well, we know all things work together for good. Them love God. Them are called according to His purpose. Okay, I'll trade places with you. You can get on your back in this bed and you do not know how certain your future is and you worry about your wife and your kids and all the other things going on and whether the church is going to go on and whether your kids are going to get out of school and the kid that's gone prodigal and all that kind of stuff. And then I'll come in here and give you that kind of comfort, okay? <laughs> you can't comfort nobody with that kind of stuff. You know what you do? You recognize that that... Time is for a season. Joy comes in the morning. You say, when's the morning? Sometimes the morning's a long way off. You want to give you the impression that it's this idea that I have this joy. I know the joy of the Lord is our strength. I understand that. I know because you haven't served the Lord thy God with joy and gladness of heart that the devil puts a yoke of iron on your neck. I understand all of that stuff. But you've got to rightly divide even up to and including when you apply those verses. You put undue pressure on yourself when you think you're supposed to be happy when you've got the virus thing or a flu and you've got 104 temperature and the devil comes up to you and goes, where's your joy? Where's your joy? Why aren't you happy? You should be happy. You know, and you're kind of thinking, man, I can't even remember a verse of scripture right now. I'm doing good to remember Jesus wept. And, you know, you ever talk to somebody that's trying to take care of an individual that's an invalid and things? They didn't plan it in that life. And now all of a sudden they're changing diapers of their parent. And you say, well, what's the matter with you? Are you depressed? No, I'm just weighted down. I'm just burdened. Phone rings at 3 o'clock in the morning. You need to get over here. He fell. He's all tore up. He's ripped up. You got you to gotta come over here. We're going to have to go to the hospital. He's acting out of his mind. He's throwing his wheelchair at people or his walker at people. You better get over here right away. Oh, we're sorry to bother you. I know it's early in the morning, but he fell. He's got a big gash. We've got to take him to the hospital. Go over and spend all night at the hospital. Then they send him back after running the test and they give you the bill and put him back in there. And by the way, we need some more diapers for him. And he doesn't have a lotion. And he put his teeth in upside down. And he about choked to death during the night. And he's out wandering the halls in the middle of the nighttime and that kind of a stuff. And we can't get him under control and that kind of a deal. And oh, where's the joy of the Lord on Sunday morning? Well, I was up all Saturday night. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm not, I promise you I'm not getting on to you. I'm trying to get you to get a balance. People have lives. Listen, folks, the fact of the matter is whether you should or shouldn't be afraid, the fact of the matter is when people get the virus, they get scared. They presented an image to you when this first thing first started that if you got it, you died. And they did it intentionally, but the bottom line is this. They presented the image that if you got it, you died. And then they kept flashing every day on the news that you are addicted to how many people died. You didn't take the time to lay out the billions of people in the United States and worldwide to look at the number and go, well, shoot, man, that ain't, that ain't like one in ten, man. That's like one in a million. But you didn't do that. It was crafted in order to make you hit the panic button and then you get stressed and then you get alone and then you're like, you know, and somebody comes in and said, where's the joy of the Lord? I'm freaking out right now. And then God help you, somebody you knew wound up in the hospital and then they went through the process and then they got on a ventilator and oh my God, there's a kiss of death and then they die and you can't even go to the funeral. 
five people at a funeral. I can't tell you how many I did that way. People, they won't even let you have them at the funeral home. I went and did one just the other day. I'm standing out there. It's kind of cold and drizzly out there, and the family's gathered out there, and the funeral people said, now we only have room for six chairs under the tent. And I just looked at the lady like, are you, are you just absolutely insane? There's people that drove from all over the United States. We're standing outside. Well, you, you know, everybody has to have a mask and everybody has to have this and everybody this and so on. I'm not going to directly disobey. And so then we got up there and the lady that's underneath the tent thing, she's in charge of where the gravesite is. I said, uh, six chairs. I said, these people come from a long way. I said, uh, is there anything we can do about that? She said, well, I can't say anything about it if you all push the chairs together and you gather all up. I said, thank you. It's all I need to know. <laughs> I appreciate it. And so she just kind of made herself absent, and we brought that whole group in there and all that kind of stuff. But the thought or the mindset was back when we started, of, well, well, what if I get it? I better not go to, I better not go to church. I might get it at church. Oh, I mean, I'm, I still go to Walmart. She'll go to my favorite restaurant because, you know, those, the virus is smart. It knows it don't jump past the edge of the table, right? But I, I better not go to church. I mean, what am, what am I going to? And so the next thing, you know what happens? The joy comes out of there and is replaced with fear. Tobiah moves in. And the Lord said, hey, what are you afraid of? I'm with you always. I got you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I got you. You ought to take some consolation in that, Christian. You ought to put yourself in the position of your pastor. You've got to show up. It's the weirdest thing in the world. I'm going to get to this in a second. And we first started that thing, and they told us five people, and I know the sheriff and all the other stuff in my town, and that kind of a deal, and I called him up, and he said, well, they're kind of clamping down from up to upstairs, and we'll see how it goes and all. So we started out in five people in the church there. I'm preaching to empty pews, I'm putting it out over the, the thing, the whatever you call that. And people are at home watching that stuff and they want to be at church. And the law said you can't come to church and you can't have together. Everybody looks like a good. Ghost town. Take you five minutes to go. Go anywhere. I mean, everybody's just shut down, man. It's like you're at the tribulation or something. And you pull in there, man. You don't even have opening hymn. No singing. And you get up there and you're trying to get started and you look over there and you go, let's see, Brother Mitch usually... So I just started going, isn't that right, Brother Mitch? And <laughs> He's not sitting there, you know. And How about that, TK? Is that right? You know, hey, Mary, is that, you know, I mean, I started talking to that because in my mind, I couldn't make sense. I'm looking at empty pews and I'm thinking, I'm just going to call people's names out. You talk about a weird thing. You say what could happen. That was an attempt to see whether or not they could just go ahead and shut it down. And then all of a sudden the people said, you know what, I'm kind of tired of that. And then they started coming back in and started coming back in. And thank the Lord that you did. But you have to think about that. That's a lot of pressure on your pastor. Did you pray for your pastor? The decision he makes. He makes a decision to let people come into the church. And then somebody in the church dies. You won't think he got it at Walmart. You won't think he got it at the restaurant. You won't think he got it from one of your kinfolk. You know what you'll say? That's what happens when you go to church. Somebody in the church was infected and didn't tell me about it, and I got it from them, and now my loved one's gone. You say, who'll see to that? Tobiah. He'll make sure of that. Absolutely make sure of that. You say, what does that have to do with that? That's just an absolute uh, laying out practically of how your mind thinks when you think in the flesh. Do you ever realize this, ladies and gentlemen, that sometimes God lets bad things happen to good people? But it's not because he's chastising you because you did something wrong. I think I'm in that same passage there. You come down in Hebrews 12. Doesn't he say, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth. You, did you read the next verse? He didn't just say the ones that are disobedient. He didn't just say the ones that are bad. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 that I may know him, the power of his resurrection through the fellowship of his what? Do you know it? Of his what? Preacher said it. Of his what? Suffering. Paul said, Lord, put me through it. 
You ever look at Paul's life? Look at it real quick. I'm just get off on this for a second here if I don't get on anything else. This is a hard thing for a disciple to understand. Uh, oftentimes the Lord will put you through certain things just for the purpose of teaching other people. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. Paul's going to show you what it is to be a minister. Paul wasn't backslidden. You know that, right? While you're looking at that, let me read this thing to you over in uh, um, 2 Peter here, 1 Peter. This is the Lord talking. The Lord talking in 1 Peter chapter number 2. He said, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief and suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it when, a man, when you're buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently... This is acceptable with God. Preacher, they're hammering me for doing right. The Lord said, what a blessing. <laughs> he said, for even hereunto were uh, you called, because Christ, were you called? Yeah. But because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Paul says over there in, 1 Corinthians, or in Philippians chapter number 1, he comes down to the end of that passage there, and he gets there and he said, uh, having the same thing that you saw in me and that you become behind in no thing and this and that and the other, and also to suffer for his sake. You're kidding me. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, he says uh, that you're saved, your salvation is a sure thing. And then he says in 2 Timothy 2, around verse 12 there, he said, if so be that you suffer. Romans chapter 8, same thing, suffer. The passage where I'm going to show you right now in 2 Corinthians, that suffering, ladies and gentlemen, is not always you getting your britches tore up because you did something wrong. Sometimes it's for God's glory. Sometimes it's for your good so that you can be an edification to other people, 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, so when they go through trouble, you can help them get through the trouble. And that's the Lord rewarding you for having put you through something so you can help somebody else. The Lord rewards you doubly, one, for letting Him put you through it without you griping, moaning, and complaining, and two, for then using what you've been through to help somebody else to get through what they're getting through. And the Lord said, now I like that. That's ministry. That's like me. That, that's, that's exactly like me. I endure suffering, I endure shame, I endure being reviled, made fun of, mocked, belittled. I have enemies for doing right. Nobody can question that. And the Bible says there in 1 Peter chapter number 2, he said, who did no sin. So, he did, so he's not getting his chastisement. You can't say the Lord's being chastised for wrong. Well, sometimes your chastisement comes, it's not for wrong. Stop all of a sudden thinking, what did I do? Now that should be the first thing that enters your mind. I mean, I fall down the stairs or something. The first thing I think is, is what did I do now? I don't think immediately, oh, this is for God's glory or to make me a laughing stock. The first thing I think of is, is that he's tanning me for something. But if right off the bat, that thing gets cleared out, and you're thinking, well, Lord, I, my conscience is clear the best I can. I've bled the blood, and I'm trying to do the best I can possibly do. And then you ask this, okay, Lord, then help me with it. And number two, show me what you want me to do with it. There's nothing that will tune a Christian up quicker and find out where he stands than when all of a sudden he doesn't get lollipops, rainbows, and unicorns and all of a sudden his lot in life is as the Lord sees fit to drain the bank account or to cause the divorce or allow the divorce to occur. A kid goes prodigal or something like that. That's a trial of your faith. That shows whether you're spiritual or not. Can you see into eternity? If you can't look into eternity, this life will make no sense to you at all. The only way a Christian can make sense of anything is to look at the author and finisher of our faith. Look out there in eternity. Look where it's going to end. That's the key that he's given you in Hebrews. He's saying, listen, suffering's going to come. The way you endure that is look past what you're going through now and see way out there. Man, I'm going to be in eternity one day. I'm going to have a mind like Christ. I'm going to have a body like Christ. I'm going to never sin again. I'm going to never hurt again. I'm going to always be in the perfect will of God. I'm going to be the bride of Christ I'm going to be doing what he wants me to do I'll never have another concern I'll never have another worry I'll never have any of the things that bother me now boy hallelujah and you look at that and you're like okay well this trial is but for a moment I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm okay well how are you doing and endure and I hate to tell you what I'm about to tell you before I show you this but if Paul's the pattern right before he goes 
gets his head cut off. And then he says, you know, that he's finished his course and kept the faith and henceforth laid at me a crown of righteousness for all those that love is appearing. He's kind of saying to you right at the end, a Christian, you may have some increased persecution. I hate to tell you, it's going to get worse for Christians. You don't have to fall away like everybody says in the Bible will fall away. You don't have to be one of those that falls away. But you do have to recognize if Paul's the pattern, it's not going to be rainbows, roses, and unicorns tomorrow. You may wake up to a cloudy, storm-filled sky tomorrow. Look, the towers came down, right? Whatever you think, it's a towel head that did it or whether you think it was a conspiracy from out of Texas. I, I don't really care. When the towers fell, the righteous and the unrighteous went down. The saved and the unsaved went down. You've got to recognize when the Pentagon was hit, there's actually a few saved people there. They died just like everybody else did. And for Christians, you know what's going to happen? We're going to have Christians that are going to die from the virus or whatever you want to call that. We're going to have Christians that are in automobile accidents. We're going to have Christians that wind up getting killed in war. You're not insulated. If anything, you don't have, you're running through life without a bulletproof vest on. You're going to become the first target. You say, why? There's a demonic entity behind that, and you are his enemy because you're God's friend. It's more to it than just, you know, I don't know what the law is trying to do to me. It ain't the law. It's the devil. Doesn't he say that? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. No, it's the government. It's the, it's the government. It's, it's a guy in the outhouse up there. I, I know who it is. I know you Southerners. You ready to grab the flag and charge the White House. And the Lord's like, would you give me a break? Our kingdom's not of this world. If it were so, I'd fight for it and I'd take it. I'd whoop you with one hand tied behind me. I'm not here to ride the path of the second advent now. I'm here to die. Not so, Lord, said the independent Baptist Peter. You're not going to die, Lord. You're not going to Calvary, Lord. No, sir, Lord. You know what the Lord said? Get thee behind me, Satan. I'm not here to preserve my life. Christians have got in this self-preservation mode and not just preferring to, to, to preserve their own uh, 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 monetary or, 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 or material things, to preserve their life. The Lord came down, you know what He said? I came to die. You know what He said to the shepherds out there? He said, uh, the angel appeared up to Him and He said, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Swaddling clothes, grave clothes. He came down here in his mind when he was in a womb of a virgin. He was God in the flesh, in that womb. You know what he came down here for? When he left just a few days before, he came down here as God. You know what he said? I'm going to die. 33 years he was completed living all the life he needed to live because he came down here not for the purpose of living a life on the earth but to die. Now, I realize I sound like an apostate right now and some of you are real nervous because you're fulfilling the Bible the where he says in Job, skin for skin, all the man hath, he'll give for his life. You can't hear what I'm saying unless you're listening in the Spirit because it don't make any sense to your flesh. Your flesh is self-preserving. It wants to preserve it. It wants its rights. And I'm telling you now, what happens is, is all of a sudden you get preachers that get all caught up in politics, they get all caught up in prejudice and personal opinions. That doesn't help anybody. All that does is landlock you. I got a right. I got a right. You know what that'll do? That'll make you one of the meanest, most bitter people in the church. You'll always be talking about somebody hurt your feelings and somebody did something to you. And the Lord's down there going, somebody hurt your feelings? Seriously? You know, well, Lord, what do you know about it? Uh, well, <laughs> what are these wounds I received in the house of my friends? The people he came to help. Why would you expect the church to be any different? I'm sure this church is not different. I'm sure that, uh, that it's not any different than the other preacher's church that's here and that kind of thing. I'm, I'm sure that everybody's uh, nice in your church. But some of the churches I've been to, people are so stinking thin-skinned, thin -skinned, as a preacher used to say, you can blow smoke through them. And they're looking to be, you say, why? You're living for this world. Instead of going, hey, I'm not here for you, not here for what you think, and I'm not here to look at you, I'm here to find Jesus. Amen. I like the passage, and we use it at the Jubilee thing. Sir, we would see Jesus. Amen. Boy, if you could put that in every door of every Amen. church before you walk in and say, could you just come in here looking for Jesus instead of looking to be offended? Amen. Well, I was coming in here, preacher, you know, then I come here, somebody come whooshing through the parking lot, so fast, the wind about blowed me down. We'll walk to the door a different way. 
Yeah, I, I was in here, that feller's out there blowing down the parking lot, and I parked my car, done blowed leaves all over my parking lot, all of me, all over my car. Why can't he get in here earlier and get that done so I can take my freshly washed car out there and park it at an angle so nobody bumps my doors and stuff, preacher? Well, oh, so everybody see you have a new car? Well, preacher, you know, I mean, the, the rain falls on the just and the just does, but so do the and unjust, but so do the blessings. You know, you, you give to God with a spoon, He gives back to you with a shovel. Are you charismatic or something? You've been listening to Benny Hinn, or what is, what is wrong with you, you know? You must have gone to see Ernest Ainsley. Be healed, baby, you know, I don't, what, 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 what is that? I got a guy that comes after work, he's got a blower out there, he's blowing the parking lot so that when people come it looks nice and he doesn't blow leaves all over my car. I just washed it, washed it, that's the sound. W-A-R-S-H-E, washed, I didn't wash it today. I said to him, I said, sir, did you wash it? He goes, yeah. I said, you got out there with a rag and a bucket and washed it. He goes, well, I mean, I, I, well, I mean, I drove it through the wash. I, I, that's, I'm, I, I mean, I get, I'm thinking, man, you know what, why don't you just go on to the house? <laughs> Because if that ain't going to offend you, then you're going to trip over the threshold or something else. Gonna... Now, now, I'm sure you're not that way. But when a church gets carnally minded, that stuff spreads like cancer. And then before long, your eyes are off Jesus and everything else. And sometimes the Lord has to bring some suffering in your life to tone you down and to make you realize, you know something, hold on a minute. I've gotten a little carried away here with my own personal ideas. I guess I'm getting a little loud. I apologize. I'm... Y'all get me stirred? Either that or that coffee's kicking in one. I don't know. <laughs> but you, folks, you, you have to understand the only way you can make sense of what we're doing at all is to see it from a spiritual perspective. You've got to look way down there Amen. where we're going, not where you are now. Amen. It doesn't make sense. Now, here's something I'm going to tell you. Uh, here's, here's Paul real quick. First or Second Corinthians chapter number 11. Give me about five minutes and then we'll take a short break. Uh, notice what he says. Of the Jews five times received by 40 stripes, save one. That will equate to 195 stripes Paul got. Not one time to the Apostle Paul being, I'm in 2 Corinthians 11, I'm in verse number uh, 24. He said, I'm a minister of Christ. Isn't that what he said? Now watch him. He's going to tell you he's a minister. I got a big church. I run so many in Sunday school. I got a choir. I got special music. Uh, we got a giant building program. No, you know what Paul says? He said, of the Jews five times received by 40 stripes, save one. Find for me where Paul was out of the will of God. Find for me where Paul was backslidden. Find for me where Paul, who the Lord says is our apostle, the apostle of the Gentiles, and he's our pattern to follow. Find for me where Paul's messed up and so the Lord's punishing him for it. He's not. He's an example. Colossians chapter number one, to fill up that which is behind. Notice what he says. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once a stone, suffered shipwreck, day and a night in the deep. Journeyings often, perils of water, perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, perils of the heathen, perils of the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils of the false brethren, weariness, painfulness, watchings often, hunger, thirst, fastings often, cold, nakedness, besides those things that are without, which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Paul said, I'm a minister. The Lord said, whom I love, I chasten and scourge every son, every son, every son, every son whom I receive. Sometimes that scourging comes in order to make you more spiritually minded and set us so earthly minded. You'd be surprised how quick all that money you've been putting up like last night in the alabaster box and putting it up and putting it up and saving it up for your retirement and saving it for the future and saving it all this and all of a sudden you get a diagnosis and you're going to die in six months. You'd be surprised how quick things will change. You'd be surprised all of a sudden, you know, you get your back hurt or something happens to you and you were planning on retiring and, you know, going and fishing all the time or hunting all the time or traveling the world over and this and that and the other. And just like that, something happens to you and now you're thinking to yourself, man, I'm going to be in a wheelchair the rest of my life or on crutches or I'm going to have to walk around with some oxygen in my nose or whatever because I... This was the Lord. The Lord says, hey, listen, what if I take you tomorrow? I didn't say anything wrong with having all your stuff. No problem at all. Have all you want as long as you have it and it doesn't have you. But you see, you're living in a day now where carnality has swept over the churches. You don't have to worry about the, the devil jumping in here and making you fool around with a Ouija board or rock and roll music. Most of you independent Baptists, 
your tendency will be to go the other way. You'll be religious. You'll be pharisaical. You'll be, you know, touch not, taste not, handle not. Uh, make sure you wash your hands and don't eat the corn on Sunday and, and don't do this and don't do that. And you're doing that so that you can find out if other people are doing that. So it sets you above them in the hierarchy. That's where your tendency will be. Both of them are out of balance. I believe in living a clean life. It's easy for me to do that. If you understand, for 20 years, somebody told me everything to do. There was a rule or a regulation for everything I did. How to dress. How dare them. You had to wear your uniform a certain way. You had to wear your hair a certain way. You had to have your mustache cut a certain way. You had to shoes, your gun belt a certain way. Everything, the brass on here, half inch from the side and a quarter inch from this side and has to be here and has to be facing this way and has to follow the line. Gig line has to be straight, has to be in line with where your shirt is, comes down and buttons down, ties in with where your trousers zip up there and the belt has to be there. The old days of the Sam Brown where you had a, a belt buckle here and the handcuffs on your weak side and the gun on this side and we didn't have tasers in my day, man. You know, don't tase me, bro. That wasn't anything like that in my day. It was don't hit me, bro. Because, I mean, all you had was a stick that was made out of plastic or whatever that bounce off of them. And, of course, then you had to carry a flashlight with you in case, you know, even during the daytime if you, if you well, well, that's necessary. You may, you never know. You might have to run into a closet or a warehouse and there's no lights and you got to be able to see. And so, but sometimes you got, you got to do with whatever, at any rate, <laughs> statute of limitations. But at, but at any rate, they told me everything to do. And then you walk into church and a preacher says to you, you know what, you shouldn't be listening to that. Who's he to tell me? What? He's trying to help you. You shouldn't eat this, you shouldn't do that. Isn't that what you tell your kids? I, no, I guess not. I guess you live in here. No, I let them grow up and do whatever they want to do. I mean, you know, don't make any difference to me. Okay, we'll see how that works out for you. Here's the point I'm trying to make. Sometimes the Lord says, you know what, I love you, so I'm going to chasten you. The issue is not whether or not he's right in chastening. The issue is, is my son despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him, or chastened. You know what he says? Don't despise it. God's trying to give you a reward and you can't even see it. 